Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. Uh, I'm Jeff Edwards for UW Extension with my co-host, Jeremiah Vardaman. Good morning, Jeremiah. Morning. How are we doing? Good to see you. Good to have you here. Uh, also with us is Jenny Thompson. You might not see her, but you may hear her today um, uh, adding input and, and pulling questions forward and those types of things. Our guest today is Catherine Wisner. Hello, Catherine. Hey, everybody. Catherine is a horticulturist for um, Cheyenne. I lost the county. <laughs> or Laramie, Laramie County. county. Thank you, Laramie <laughs> County. <laughs> it's going to be one of those days. <laughs> so, um, uh, for you, for those of you who are joining us and um, uh, haven't used Zoom that much in the past, uh, if you have questions for us, questions for Catherine today, please uh, just use your mouse and scroll over the top of Zoom, and some buttons will pop up at the bottom. Either enter those questions in the Q and A button or the chat button, and we'll pull those forward to her. If you are joining us live via Facebook, I got it correct today, didn't I? You did. <laughs> and you have a question, please use the uh, comment area, type it in there, and we'll pull it forward and get it asked for you. Um, today, we were kind of playing around with this title a little bit, and we thought, wouldn't it be fun if uh, we called it that our victory garden was defeated? Um, but uh, uh, Catherine has changed that up a little bit, and I think it, we we're talking about uh, uh, just basically some things to avoid in order to have a sex, successful gardening season. So uh, I think without further ado, I am going to turn the floor over to you, Catherine, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, I am going to share my screen here. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we're okay. good to go. <laughs> that's, that's always encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I titled the program Victory Vegetable Success in the Garden because I, I really want to set everybody up for success and have good harvest and, and come out of the end of the gardening season feeling good about what they've done and that they can do this again and, and look, look at all the vegetables I got. So with that, there are a few rules, a few gardening rules. And, and so I put it in my perfect world because not everybody's gonna have that sandy loam soil to, to grow in. Working the soil, you only wanna work the soil when it's dry. And I know a lot of people just really chomp at the bit when it's nice and warm out sometime in in later in March or April and the soil's wet and they work the soil when it's wet. And so that causes some problems there. You only want to plant in warm soil. Vegetables want a lower pH. So if seven is neutral and our soils are normally like seven and a half or eight, trying to get it a little bit lower is, is, is a, a vegetable gardener will try to chase that pH. And usually the best way to do that is with peat moss, just good old peat moss. Watering, vegetables want their water just spot on consistent. They don't want, oh, I forgot, I'll do it tomorrow. They don't work that way. Fertilizer, gotta be really careful with what you fertilize a vegetable garden with. You've got, you gotta worry about the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, manures are going to have a lot of salts in them and the EC level of EC and salts go together. It's electric conductivity. So you want to always keep the salts low. Weeds are thieves. They will steal the nutrients. They harbor insects and diseases. So that's a constant battle and they need to be kept down. The use of mulches like straw or grass clippings really helpful to kind of keep those weeds down and keep the soil moisture in and in the wind the wind is is a little challenging for some areas and so trying to find a location that's protected or create your own protection put up put up like a temporary snow fence to keep the wind down if you have access to other things like straw bales you can use those to help protect from the wind and in the sun. So this is kind of another area of myth on, on the sun, but 
in all the years that I've been vegetable gardening, I have found that the east sun, east morning sun, as the sun comes up in the east, that is the best. And it warms those vegetables up, it gets the dew off of them, it gets them working right away. And then some afternoon shade is really helpful for a lot of the vegetables, especially your peppers. As peppers, the fruit will actually sunburn in the afternoon sun. So uh, there's no lotion to put on them. You just have to give them some shade. No, no, no SP50? <laughs> no, no SP50 for, for peppers. And just a little shade. And, and you can make your own shade with some floating row cover or um, an old sheet or something like that to throw them on in the afternoon. So those are just some, some first steps to set yourself up for success. So where do we want to start, Catherine? Where that's, do we want that's, to... that's a big list. Where, that is a where huge do we list. want to tackle this? I mean, and we're probably not going to get very in depth on each one of these. There, there's a skill and an art to each one of those. And we only have an hour. So where do we want to start with that? Well, let's start with looking at what the growing season is. And I think a lot of gardeners don't understand that we have a very short growing season here in Wyoming. I always tell everyone to plan on 90 days. Be happy if you get more. If you're up in the Star Valley area, you're looking at 30 to 60 day growing season. So that is exceptionally challenging. Wyoming, <laughs> if we have, there, there's ways to get around that, but I, you guys have restricted me to an hour, so that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair. This is vegetable gardening is my passion. Um, Wyoming's got cool nights, and sometimes that slows a lot of the plants down, and and that can actually make their that plant's growing season longer than what the packet says. So, so weather sometimes causes us some problems and then of course we have droughts that's kind of i mean we're always in a drought right whenever out of a drought we just have some years that are better than others so my vegetable gardening rule is on watering the first one and vegetables are not drought tolerant they, they they want water they're water thirsty they're they're water they're fish they want lots of water and so i find that people who do inconsistent watering kind of skip a day here and there, or, oh, it rained, you know, and we got a hundredth of an inch, you know, no, your watering has got to be really consistent and spot on. And so it helps to know your soils. Hold on a second, Catherine. I want to catch up with you. Okay. So first okay. of all, if you're not aware of what growing degree days or growing days you have, right, growing days that you have in your area, on the Barnyards and Backyards website, and I think Jenny will probably throw that link up in the chat box or comments section, there's a, a list of the different towns in Wyoming and kind of roughly what their growing days are. And that is from frost-free period to frost-free period, that free window, right? From the spring right. to fall. Okay. Right. So we got that covered. And yep. so we got a comment. Yeah, no problem. So we had a comment in the chat box uh, from Christy that says, oh man, Star Valley here? Yeah, so Star Valley, Wyoming, right, is what Catherine was talking about with the growing degree days. You have 30 to 60, somewhere in between there, and they're hard growing days. Um, and Jeff threw in a good comment there. for So if you're in that kind of situation, you were really looking at low tunnels, high tunnels, geodesic dome, some type of season extension to help you to have any kind of growing season. Those 30 to 60 days are probably not continuous. <laughs> right. <laughs> you might get three here and another <laughs> seven a week later, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, go ahead. Depending upon your location, and, you know, and the other thing is if, if you don't know, and I call the extension office. Right. The extension office should know, right? That, I mean, we should know. That's why we we're here. We're growing. That's why we're here. Yeah. So yeah, just call the extension office. And, and, and Wyoming is just hugely different. It's like I'm down in Cheyenne and I've had 140 days of growing and I've also had 89 days of growing. So it just varies from that from that last frost in the spring to that first frost at the end of summer or fall, depending upon where you're at, determines that growing season. And so there's a lot of plants that don't like cold 
peppers are one of them. I have a lot of growing peppers, but they're fussy. Right. So anyway. Go ahead. Let's continue on. Sorry watering. for interrupting. Back but. to water. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. That's part of the, what we do here. Again, one of the big problems I, I encounter with vegetable gardeners, whether they're new to it or they've been doing it for a few years, and they complain about low yields, is they're not watering enough. And, and you know, so, I, you know, it's always done in like one inch or two inches a week. Well, what does, what does that mean? And, and so it helps to know your soil type. You know, are you on a clay, a medium, a fine textured soil? And so all of those soils are going to have different watering profiles. And so a lot of that will determine how long you water and when you water. The best way to water, you always, always want to keep your water on the ground at the roots. Those, those oscillators where they throw the water up into the air and around, you're going to lose anywhere from 40 to 60% of that, of that water just in it blowing away by the wind or evaporation. And then it just lands on the, on the leaves and it still has to drip down to the roots. So that's a long way for that water to get to where it needs to go. Put your water on the ground. Use soaker hose. Soaker hose doesn't last a long time, but it's still a very effective way of watering. My favorite way to water my garden is with drip tape. It's fun to put together. It's like an erector set, you know, you tab A into slot B and it really, um, you know, yeah, my, mine too. Water. I pre I prefer drip tape. It uh, works really well. I, mm -hmm. And I'll just caution: if it's, you are going to use drip tape, you really need to understand how much water that drip tape's emitting, right? And so it's going to be set up on a scale, and you just need to understand that because that goes back to how frequent you need to irrigate and for how long you need to irrigate. Um, just yep, exactly. Never use so, yeah. So my, my garden is all on drip tape. And so this, this emitter here, all my emitters um, have half a gallon per hour. And so if you look at this picture and you can see these, this wetted profile in the soil, it gives you an idea of what that is gonna look like in your garden, but that's a half a gallon per hour. And so maybe you need to water for an hour and a half or two hours or, or, or maybe 30 minutes depending upon what stage of growth that vegetable garden is in. Not to, I, I'm not, I don't want to make it complicated, but I like drip tape. I know it, this is precision irrigation. I know how much water I'm using. I know how much that plant's getting. And the whole, and so it, you garden in a straight line, Jeff. I have to garden I in know. a straight line with drip tape. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. The other rule... <laughs> You can get more plants in a crooked line. <laughs> you can't. No, you can't. Look at that straight line right there. I can plant on both sides. And the beauty of drip tape or a soaker hose is I can, I can shoehorn in a lot more. I can put peppers 18 inches on center here. I can put my tomatoes 18 inches on center and stake, you know, grow them up. That's growing tomatoes up is, is the way to go because they're not on the ground. They're... I, I really didn't mean to punch that button. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> but, but with soaker hose, you can grow in a circle. There you go. <laughs> you can grow in, in that dome thing. <laughs> the, I highly recommend timers. These are your best friends. You want to go on a vacation for two weeks? Just change out the battery if you're a little nervous about the battery. And it's easy, easy to program. It comes on, it goes off. It's, it adds to that precision watering and it helps save you water. And you will actually come home from vacation to green, healthy vegetables, where if you rely on your neighbor kid, <laughs> you're gonna come home to a wet, sobby garden of dead plants. I guarantee it. Or, so, or, or timer. Or neighbor adult. It, <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to be a child. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and those timers come in different styles, right? And so you yep. can, we use a very low tech timer at ours where you just dial up how long you want it to run for. You can get the programmable kind where you, once you set it, it's done and it runs for you while you're not there. So, I mean, but they are a handy technology, low cost for the benefit you get. All of my watering yep. at my place is on a timer. Yep, yep. I have, uh, I have a big rainbird timer because I'm a geeky horticulturist. But these timers are just, they're, they're your best friend. They're going to be your best employee in the vegetable garden. I'm not a reliable waterer. I have a tendency to turn the water on and walk away and do other chores and come back half a day later and go, oops. But this adds to that precision. And so, and that's what your vegetables want. They, they want water on a certain time and they don't want to go dry. They, they want to stay moist. So this, this is your best friend in the garden. So the other thing I, I hear about is it's the soil. Everyone wants to blame the soil and we look at our soil and go, well, it's the color of a paper bag. How can we grow anything in that? And, and so there's the assumption that we don't have good soil here. And, and I'm, I disagree with that. <laughs> I see Jeremiah going away. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm waiting to stop you. Before okay. we get too much into soil, we got a question. Uh, okay. And it said, and from Shannon, really appreciate this question. A great question. Uh, is there a best time of day to water? Yes. And actually, I, I, I intend to talk about that a little bit more later on, but I'll address it now. The best time to water is not at, not at sunrise, not in early morning, because those plants aren't ready for the water. Let them warm up, either water them around 11 in the morning. So they've, they've warmed up, they've woken up and the sun is, is warming the fruit or warming the plant. And so now they're ready to take in the water or you can water it late in the day, you know, as the sun is setting, they're still warm. But if you try to water them when it's cold out in the early morning or cool, they're not happy with that. They don't like that. They want, they want mid-morning, late afternoon watering. Yeah. And, a good, and a good concept with vegetables, at least from my perspective, Catherine, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but vegetables like warm and they like good water. Yes. Those are the two big things they really want. They, they don't deal with cold very well. Granted, we can get into cool season, warm season, yada, yada, but it, they really like warm temperatures and they like plenty of water yep. in response. Yep. We have another question for you from Barb. How is drip tape different from soaker hose? So drip tape is, is more precise with the little emitters. You know exactly how much water you're giving that plant on drip tape where soaker hose is just this big, long sponge that leaks the whole length. And so you don't really know how much water you're giving that plant. So you really have to pay attention to the soil and check your soil moisture consistently. Or if you, if you like doing a little minor math and, and kind of having fun with the irrigation, drip tape is, is the way to go. And I, I know exactly what I'm giving my plants, but I don't with soaker hose. Yeah, that drip tape is is a precise and the uh, precise irrigation at a location, right? And that water only comes out at a certain portion or a certain spot on that drip tape, and uh, versus a soaker hose, like you said, it, it just pours out. Yeah, the pours. the emitters on a drip tape you can purchase them four inches on center up to sixteen inches on center, and uh, whereas a soaker hose just leaks the whole entire length of it. Yep. Hopefully that answers so your my, question. The drip tape I use, yep, the drip tape I use is eight inches on center. And, and so I can really manipulate a lot of stuff in there. Uh, it, it gives you a lot of flexibility in a straight hey, line. <laughs> I think we're now ready for okay. soil, Catherine. Let's, okay. let's go with soil. Okay. So I, I, this is the other thing I run into is a lot of myths about soil. So this is a lot of myth busting here. There's a lot of assumptions about your soil. And this was a yard call that came in for me. I just know it's bad. I just know my soil is bad. So I rototilled in eight bags of compost in a 10 by 10 area. We grew squash, melons, mom wanted some corn. Well, nothing has grown. It popped up and has barely grown about six inches tall. The same with the melon. I know it's the soil. 
well, did you get a soil test? You, you don't know if, what your soil is until you get a soil test. You can't make the assumption that it's bad or good until you get a quantifiable data to help guide you. And so the soil tests aren't expensive. Um, we use Colorado State University. It's a local for us regional lab. You don't wanna send it back east because they use different methods of soil testing than we do here. Colorado State University knows our soils and are gonna give you the right answer. And so this was a soil test done after the fact. It was sent down to Colorado State University. The pH came back at 7.6. And again, remember, seven is neutral. When you start getting higher, it's a more alkaline soil. Lower is a more acidic soil. And well, for Wyoming, 7.6 is actually pretty darn good. <laughs> that's not bad. That's not bad. Vegetables want a pH, an, a more acidic soil. Six and a half, six. Uh, potatoes actually like it at five and a half. They're almost as bad as blueberries. But the thing that caused the, the biggest problems with this garden, other than eight bags of compost of manure, uh, was the salts. And so a lot of people have a hard time understanding the salt issue or the electric conductivity. So you can pass a current of electricity through salt. And so that's how they measure that. And at 14, that makes it a saline soil and so you're you're it'd be like trying to grow vegetables in a salt shaker can't do it the uh the nitrogen which is on a bag of fertilizer you've got three numbers those those mystery three numbers the first number is nitrogen and this is written in stone so the first number is nitrogen and that tells a plant to grow and to grow a lot but it doesn't tell the plant to necessarily put down good strong roots or fruit or flower. So it just tells the plant to grow a lot. This is almost 30% nitrogen. I'd, I'd even be hesitant to put that on my lawn. The next one is phosphorus and phosphorus is a vegetable gardener's friend. And so at 38%, uh, it's, a, it's a little high, but not bad. Phosphorus does need nitrogen to work, but not 30%. And then the potassium, potassium is a salt. And 104% potassium makes that very, very salty soil. And so that's why this person is having a hard time growing in it. And you can see, you know, vegetables, when you do a soil test, you want the salts or the EC electric conductivity to be zero or two. That's a happy vegetable garden. But at 14, that puts it down into moderately saline. Uh, not going to work. So my other rule is on manures. And, and so I'm going to get on my soapbox about this. But manures are not your best friend. And this is a, a back east gardening myth. And I know great, great grandpa put manure in his garden. And farmers throw manures out on their farm field, but it's spread out over a huge area. And what I run into is vegetable gardeners like to just put bags and bags and be like, more is better. I'm gonna grow my vegetables in a manure pile. Ew. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, this and is I would my say, so Catherine, the, you know, the, this old tradition or old myth or whatever you wanna call it, it, it may work back east because they get the high amount of moisture that that flushes and drains those soils back there. And so it'll leach out that salt. It, it can break down and, and decompose, but out here in our arid climate, it, it, we don't have that capability. We don't have that benefit of it. And possibly like for that individual that sent you that soil analysis, that's maybe why their salts are so high. Yeah, could be. Uh, manures have a lot of soil borne pathogens in them. I, I have never seen a well composted manure pile in anyone's barnyard. Oh, it's been sitting there for five years. Okay, has it ever been turned? Well, probably not. And so the, the, the base of it is just concentrated salts and manure <coughs> are actually very, very low in nitrogen. NPK is really, really low, like, 5% or less, but the salts are off the charts. And then the other thing you've got, you have to worry about, you have to consider is 
is the E. coli, the salmonella, and the listeria. And those can stay alive in those manures for up to a year. And, and so it's, you know, you don't want to get sick. You don't want to make anyone else sick. Horse manure is notorious for weed seeds. Horses are horrible processors of food. And, and so the weed seeds don't ever get digested. They just pass through. And those weed seeds are survivalist. And even if that manure pile has been sitting there for five years, those weed seeds are probably still alive. Manure in a bag, compost manure in a bag, sheep, cow, mushroom. You do not know what the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium levels are. You don't know what the salt levels are. And so you can actually make your soil quite toxic like that other person did. I mean, that, that was a toxic, that was toxic soil. Couldn't grow on that ever. So <laughs> to bring home the point, a friend suggested horse manure on my strawberries. I'm not doing that again. I'm going back to whipped cream. <laughs> so fertilizer, what are you going to do? Do not use miracle Grow. I, I don't mean to pick on them. They've got some great products, but don't use miracle Grow in your, in your vegetable garden. Even if it says for tomatoes or whatever, it's too high in nitrogen. And all you'll have is a big, lush, leafy plant. Bushy. bushy. I mean, you'll have the biggest tomato plant on the block. And it'll, it'll look amazing, but you won't get any fruit off of it. So make your own fertilizer. And this comes from, this recipe comes from Dr. Elaine Ingham of the Soil Food Web. She was a professor at Oregon State University and um, spun off a business. The American Hosta Society and the American Irish Society also use the same method. So you want to take one pound of alfalfa pellets, not rabbit pellets, not rabbit food pellets, but go to the feed store and, and just buy a big 50 pound sack of alfalfa pellets. It'll set you back like $12 and it'll last you for several seasons. You're going to take that alfalfa pellets and you're going to soak it overnight, one pound in a five gallon bucket. The next morning you're going to add a quart of corn syrup to this five gallon bucket and then you can add a little fish emulsion, like two tablespoons to gallon. Stir it all up and you're gonna give your plant one cup of this stuff per week. It's fairly low in, in NPK, but we're feeding the soil. And so you always wanna feed the soil and not the plant. And so stuff like miracle Grow and, and those others, other products, they're all force feeding the plant and not helping the soil. And you want the soil to feed the plant. Catherine, before we go on, mm -hmm. we got to go back a little bit. We got a question came in from Christy. Okay. Our garden was put in an old horse pasture. What is the best way to reclaim the soil? We tilled and removed plenty of manure. Anything else we can do? Um, good soil amendments, peat moss, um, uh, straw, grass clippings. I mean, I have, I have a whole nother lecture on soil amendments, so that's, that's a whole nother story. But, but uh, leaves, oh my gosh, if you can get a hold of leaves, tree leaves, coffee grounds, kitchen scraps. I, I do cold composting in my vegetable garden, so I just dig a hole, just a little hole, and I take the kitchen scraps and I dump them in there and I cover that back up. And then I go to the next spot and dig another hole and put kitchen scraps in there and just go through the whole thing. So I'm cold composting, but I'm feeding the worms. And the worms break all that stuff down into something that's much more usable to the microorganisms in the soil. And it's the microorganisms that hand this off in a symbiotic relationship to the plant, not to be complicated. The, the other recommendation I'd add to that is get something growing in there. 
period. The best, the best reclamation and, and reclaiming of soil or improvement of soil is getting something to grow. And it, it really doesn't matter what it is. I mean, even weeds can help benefit and improve a soil condition. It's not mm -hmm. ideally what we want growing there, however, but any plant growth or plant life that can take hold and root and grow there is a benefit. So if it's a, a grass or a grain or a, a leafy vegetable, whatever you can get established there, you're more the better and, and build on that success over time. Right. And, and so the other thought on that too, Jeremiah, is that you can grow kind of a sacrificial crop. So you can mm -hmm. put in um, kale and mustards and radishes and let them grow and then rototill them all in. And, and that adds to the soil fertility and that'll build your organic mat matter and it won't build up the salt level. And so you wanna be real careful with what you put back into the soil that you're not building up a toxic level of salt that you can't overcome. Okay, seeds, storing seeds. I run into this a lot too. People store, you know, buy seeds, you know, they buy them at the end of the year or whatever and they put them in their garage or their garden shed. And, and I can guarantee you that they're going to not sprout for you that next spring. They're not gonna germinate. And part of it is that the, so the temperature fluctuation in your, in your garage or your green or garden shed fluctuates so rapidly during the day. You know, at the, at the peak of day, it's gonna be hot in there. At night, it's gonna be cold in there. And so that inconsistent temperature, that up and down will kill you the seeds. So you don't ever wanna store where the temperature isn't consistent. All my seeds are stored in my refrigerator. And that's what the CRISPR drawer is for. I keep, I keep all my seeds in that. I've, I've actually outgrown the CRISPR drawer now. I have my own refrigerator for my seeds but you want that consistent temperature. The fridge, freezer, crisper drawer, but not the garden shed or the garage. Or get fresh seed stock if you don't have that, right? Right. Basically using good seed to start with is a big, big hurdle That's to overcome. Huge. It's huge. And, and so if you can't store your seeds in a, in a good spot where it's consistent temperature, then fresh seed every year, new seed every year. And yeah, I have, I have seeds that are 10 years old that are still viable. I have tomato seeds that are 10 and sweet corn that stores beautifully. Peppers are good for about five years in the refrigerator. Um, so they're, they're an investment. I look at seeds as an investment. Rotating your garden. What does that mean? You never want to plant the same thing in the same spot year after year. You always want to keep that rotation going. So just make a garden design, map your garden so you know that you grew what you grew where and that way you can rotate it. And so the rotation looks like this. Within the nightshade family are your eggplants, peppers, potatoes, tomatoes, all of those, that's one family. And then you've got legumes, your peas, snow peas, um, beans. Uh, by the way, you can grow peanuts in Wyoming. You're just not going to have a harvest like you would if you were in the South, but they do grow here and they're fun to grow. Then you've got cantaloupe, cucumbers, pumpkins, squash, watermelons, and, and then you've got um, more of the the roots, the root vegetables. So you always want to keep this on a rotation. So the, the nightshade family would go to where I'm growing mustards and turnips and those guys would move forward. And so you always want to continue to move those to reduce disease problems and not to wear out your soil excessively. So here's one garden design where she's got everything together. You know, here's, here's all the, the lettuce in one row, there's onions, the tomatoes are in another row. And so this is a shade garden. And a, so it's a salad garden that she's growing in the shade. Places to walk, place for the irrigation. So it's all on drip. 
All in straight lines. All in straight lines. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> I like I like straight lines. I like straight lines. <laughs> straight lines are good in a vegetable garden. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeff. Um, <laughs> um, this was a garden that uh, a first year gardener put in. We I talked her all through this. She's got five beds. There's a drip irrigation system, so precision watering, easy rotation very easy rotation. So what she grew in bed one gets to move to bed two and what grew in bed five moves to bed one. And so it's great rotation, easy to work in, easy to get around in. This is what it looked like in mid-August. And you can see this is, this is what precision irrigation will also get you. The soil doesn't look anything special. It looks, it makes a brown paper bag look healthy, but she's got Good water. She's amended the soil correctly. It's not over amended, but the water is spot on, and that's 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 a key. That's one of the big keys. We so hold on, Captain. Before you jump, go back. So this was great design. Um, yep. What are the items that make this a great design? What are the, the secrets or keys to success with this type of design or where it's located or anything that way? Okay. Well, it's, it's protected from the wind. It's also warm. This is a very warm location. This is uh, the fence faces. Um, I think it's south facing. So it, it gets quite a bit of sun and that's okay. The irrigation line comes in back in through here and then it comes off. This is the main line. Then it comes down to the laterals and then the secondary laterals. So it's, it's easy to either turn them off or change out. You know, maybe you don't want to grow this close together so you can, you can turn one line off and turn another line on. Rotation, easy. And when, when she takes it down in the winter, Everything can store back here because you don't want to roll drip tape up. You want to always lay it flat. And so it's easy to, it's easy to tear it down. It's easy to put it back together. It's convenient for her location. So she just walks out the back door and there it is in the backyard. So the convenience of location is huge. It's, it's right there. She can harvest, she can walk back into the kitchen or her kids, she's got um, kids, and so they can come help and harvest. And a lot with that, what you're saying about it's a nice warm spot. It has great sun exposure, right? It's in yeah. kind of direct sunlight. It does have some shading, looks like with the fence, some wind protection, mm -hmm. just kind of a lot of benefits to that. A lot of benefits to it, absolutely. And it's just got a little bit of fencing, um, rabbit fencing, to <laughs> keep the rabbits out, the bunnies out. But they've done a really nice job of putting this together and, and making it user friendly. It's the right, right size garden for her time. It's enough produce to feed her family. And so she's, she's since learned how to do canning and food preservation. So there's enough to put food up, but it matches her time and it matches and it's a convenient location and it's protected. So it, there's a whole bunch of really positive things with this particular garden. Great. Before we go on, we got a few questions. Okay. So uh, Charlie asks, I have a huge yard, which I'm building flower beds in. I have heavy clay soils. How do I amend that soil quickly? That much soil quickly, LOL. <laughs> quickly. Coffee grounds. Coffee grounds. I love coffee grounds. Uh, peat moss. Kitchen scraps. So you want to add organic matter back into that clay soil. You want to be very careful with what you add back into there. No manures, because you the clay clay soil and, and manures and salts will just put you backwards hugely. Leaves, pine needles, straw, not a lot of straw, clay and straw. Mm, don't don't want to make bricks. Um, never lime the soil in Wyoming. That's a back east thing. Uh, never, never put lime or fireplace ash in your soils, especially a clay soil. Fireplace ash is what 
great great grandma used to make lye soap with and she just ran water through the fireplace ash and decanted off lye which has got a pH of 14. And so fireplace ash will raise that pH over time and you don't want that ever in a vegetable garden. So um, organic non manure based organic matter into your clay soil. Leave and grow, grow a cover crop, grow a cover crop and grow to till it in. Grow radishes and turnips and mustards and all those, you know, kohlrabi and, and beets, whatever, grow till it all in. And that'll, that'll help build your soil too. Our next question is from Mary. Does the corn syrup in the fertilizer attract ants? No, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. And I get that question a lot when I teach master gardeners and it, it, it just doesn't. And you would think it would, but it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Our last question before we can move on. How close to my plants should I place a windbreak? How close to my plants should I place one? Well, when designing a windbreak is, is a science unto itself. And so your windbreak, well, I, I'm thinking trees. Are you thinking like a fence, like just a little fence? Hard to say. They just put in windbreak. So I think it can be physical like that, like a fence or that, or it might be uh, organic, like a tree shelter belt or something like that. Okay. Well, you can see how close her fence is to, to her vegetable garden. And so you can, you can put it like a couple feet away. You, you can have it, you can have it pretty tight. We have a, just a comment. To... Sorry, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, I think I would think that the closer it is to your vegetables, the, the more benefits you're going to get from the, the windbreak. Uh, it's more of a comment, but Carrie on Facebook said mulching with hay or straw has attracted slugs in her experience. Um, ducks are the answer for slugs. Ducks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Great. Yeah. So what's our next one? We're, we're getting close to the okay. end of our show, so we better keep going on and getting through. Okay. So weed control. And so I like, when I, when I do my vegetable garden, I want things to be multitaskers. So Jeff, this slide's for you because it's all linear. It's all, or it's all curvy. Um, <laughs> I, I like to use black plastic and you can go to a hardware store and they have bunks of wood that come wrapped in plastic and the outside is white, the inside is black. It's free. They throw that stuff away. Go get it. Use it in your vegetable garden. I put it down. It warms the soil. This is so important and everyone underestimates that your soil needs to be warm to make these vegetables happy and grow. So I put the black plastic down and this is on soaker hose. So soaker hose is a lot more um, flexible and, and so you can do a lot of fun designs with soaker hose in a vegetable garden. I put the, I dig a trench because I got to tuck the ends in, right? You got to tuck those ends in so that they don't blow away in the wind. And I use the tomato cages to hold it in place. And then I use the tomato cages for peppers because they're useless for tomatoes. So I tuck it in, the irrigation goes down first, then I put the black plastic on top. I dig a trench. I tuck it in. It looks like that. So now I'm now I've got weed control in place. I'm keeping the soil warm. I'm keeping the irrigation more precise. In other words, I'm not going to lose as much water to evaporation to soil evaporation. So my water is being more efficiently used. Then I come back in with mulch and I put that in. So I, I hate weeding. Ah, I got better things to do. So I just, and then I just cut a hole in the black plastic. I find, found the soaker hose, cut a hole in there. And then I just put the plant right through the hole. And then I dig another hole in the soil and plant it all there. So I tuck it into the black plastic. Warm soil, irrigation is precise. I'm not losing water. I'm not weeding. Okay, don't overestimate the length of the growing season. Plan for 90 days, hope for more. Be happy if you get 100. <laughs> <laughs> so days, this is the other thing I run into is that people don't understand the days to maturity. And for tomatoes, 
you've got the germination time and tomatoes germinate very quickly, five days. They can take three or four weeks to grow up to transplant size. And once you plant that transplant into the soil, that's kind of when you're gonna start counting. But I always give it another two weeks because I know it's gonna to have to go through transplant shock. So you could be looking at adding another 30 to 45 days to this, to this maturity for, especially for tomatoes and your peppers. Corn, I always add two weeks to corn. So when you buy corn, and I, and I encourage you to go through the, the catalogs instead because they're gonna give you better choices than going to the store and trying to figure out what they're trying to sell you that they think you need to have. Buy from a catalog, you know, lots of catalogs out there, Johnny's, Territorial, Park, Burpee, Langstrom, some of the, the, the name just lists go on forever. But you always wanna try, you wanna keep that number the days to maturity number small, especially with tomatoes. When you get into the 120 days, now you're starting to look at beefsteak tomatoes and you're just not gonna get a reward of a tomato. So go with the smaller ones, like the four ounces, 65 days, and there's a lot of varieties out there for that. The other way you can look at this is from, from when that plant starts to bloom, so green beans, when you start seeing that first blossom, mark your calendar for a week later and then start, start looking at harvesting. Corn, when it starts to tassel, the silk comes out, plant on, plant on three weeks. And, and so know, understand that we have a short growing season and that a lot of these vegetables have a long growing season requirement. So make sure that their growing season, the vegetables growing season matches your growing season. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about these vegetables and the smidge of time I have left. So on tomatoes, they come as either indeterminate or determinate. And the indeterminate ones are, are gonna be your, a little bit longer season, but they're gonna grow and grow and grow until something tells them to stop, like frost. The determinate ones are going to stay smaller, and those are the ones that are great for containers. They're, they're going to fit into a smaller garden space better. And, and I encourage you guys, we still have a lot of time left to grow your own tomatoes and all, all your own vegetables. Go through a seed catalog. Again, 65-day tomatoes are going to give you a good reward. And they'll give you enough to, um, to can or put up if you want to do that. Fertilizer for tomato, that first number, that nitrogen should be low. I like to make my own fertilizer. And if you don't want to make your own fertilizer, look at the numbers on the bag or box of fertilizer. That first number nitrogen should be low. If you have miracle Grow, use it for your lawn, use it for your petunias, but don't use it on your tomatoes. Drip irrigation is best. You don't want to go overhead. Too much nitrogen fertilizer again, and you're going to have huge bushy tomato plants, but no reward of fruit or very little reward of fruit. Yeah, Catherine, they do call it miracle grow, not miracle fruit. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's it's you're you're going to get growth. Tomatoes, again, they want their soil warm, 85 degrees. You know, get a, get a, I have a, a meat thermometer that I use to measure the soil temperature. And, and so I know what's going on. And that's why I use black plastic. That's why I know that soil gets to 85 degrees. And that's why I know my tomatoes are happy at 85 degrees. Blossom end rot. Do not put Epsom salts on your soil. That is, that is just the bizarrest myth in gardening. Epsom salts is magnesium, and magnesium will actually tie the calcium up. And you don't want that. <laughs> so blossom end rot is a moisture problem. Too much moisture, not enough. Inconsistent watering is what blossom end rot can, can really be. Okay, peppers. They can be a little fussy to grow. I love growing them. They're some of my favorite fruit. 
They will all change to red as they become mature. They don't stand a frost. When it starts to get cold out and, and the weather report is saying chance of frost, I go harvest everything. So again, warm soil, they want that, that 85 degree, put that black plastic down, put your irrigation under the black plastic, keep them happy. Again, don't over fertilize these guys. 5% nitrogen is all you need. I make, again, I make my own. So this picture is what I harvested off of four pepper plants out of my garden. Each one of my pepper plants need to give me back 10 pounds of fruit. That's, that's, their, that's their goal. That's the goal is 10 pounds of fruit per pepper plant. Sweet corn. Be really careful. Read that packet and make sure that you're not buying silver queen because you're never going to get a good yield or good harvest off of it until the end of the year, end of the growing season. So you want 65 days, 70 day corn. They are water pigs. They want a lot of water. And, and, and this is a type of a grass. And so they actually want more nitrogen. And so if you have that miracle grow, you can use a little bit of miracle grow on your, on your sweet corn, but be careful because you don't want 10 foot tall stalks and no corn. And again, high water requirement. The roots are shallow, not drought tolerant. There, there is no vegetables that are drought tolerant. Green beans, again, shallow rooted, not drought tolerant. These guys need an inoculant, a soil inoculant. And you, you can buy the soil inoculant through your seed catalogs like Johnny's or Territorial. And it's a rhizobian that helps the green bean take up nitrogen to grow. And, and increase your yield. So in this picture here, you can see the leaves are kind of this lemon limey color. They're, they're, they should be a deep dark green. They're not able to take up nitrogen without this rhizobium sim, symbiotic relationship. So this is a bacteria that forms nodulars on the roots and those nodulars take up the soil nitrogen and then pass it off to the plant in a form that the plant can use. So the inoculant is really important. And these plants are stunted, the yield is low. So if you like green beans, you want a lot, you want good yields, the inoculant is a must. It's not very expensive, it's like $5 for a packet. It is a living organism. So when you get it, put it in your refrigerator and don't leave it out in the counter or in the sun, um, use it when you plant your beans and then put it back in the refrigerator. It's only good for one year, so it's fragile. Potatoes. I don't mean to go so fast, but this is the, the last vegetable I'm going to talk about is potatoes. Um, only use certified seed potatoes because they'll be free of disease. You never want to use those sprouted potatoes that's in your pantry. You don't know what bacteria or fungus is on that, and you don't want to inoculate your soil with a bad fungus or a bad bacteria that's gonna cause you problems. We don't need a potato blight like yeah. Ireland faced, right? <laughs> right, right. You don't wanna create your own potato blight and never be able to grow in that garden again. They, potatoes like a more acidic soil. Water needs are huge, huge. On my drip system, they get watered every other day and they get watered a lot. So you should be getting 10 pounds of potatoes harvested per one pound planted. So 10 pounds per one pound planted. When potatoes, you plant it up, you can grow potatoes in just about anything. Don't skip the black tire thing because that's, the tires are disgusting and you don't know what's gonna leach off of them. I'm, shoot from the hip. I have a warning sticker on my forehead that says I shoot from the hip and I'm black and white <laughs> on my comments. Um, so potatoes, you're going to plant that seed potato. And so in this diagram here, potatoes start from that, that seed that you put in the ground, but they, they grow slightly above it and out from the sides of it. And the roots go down, right? The roots go down. So if you water overhead sprinkler, it's got to go onto the leaves, drip down to the soil, and eventually try to make its way down to the roots. Very ineffective, very, very ineffective. 
So here's how I do it. I start all my potatoes in a 10 by 20 tray. So it's 10 inches wide, 20 inches long, 10 by 20 tray. And I get them started and then I transplant them. I dig a big, big long trench or a bit, I dig, well, I, I get carried away in my vegetable garden. I dig a trench, I put my irrigation, and you can see the drip tape here. You can see that I put it in the trench. I put my potatoes that I started on top of the soaker, or on top of my drip tape or soaker hose, wherever you want to use. I then bury them, and I, I bury them right up to the very top leaves. I, I cover them deep. And then I, the water is right where it needs to be. It's gonna be right at the roots, right where the potato wants it. So this was, this, this is a great picture because it shows a couple of things. This is early June and these potato plants are already 18 inches tall on the top. They withstood the hail just fine. When I harvested at the end of the season, my goal is a two pound potato. I made one point, I got 1.8 and 1.7. And these three rows, I harvested 500 pounds of potatoes. I, I don't know what possessed me to do that much potatoes. It's just my husband and I, and I ran around the neighborhood and I gave potatoes away all, all, all fall. So that's my story with a few minutes left to spare. But you can see, you know, this is kind of passive aggressive. <laughs> But I've got the fork in there with my potatoes. So you can see how big, these are purple Vikings and you can see how big some of those are. And you know, I got little guys, big guys, and I have bakers and roasters and whatever. So water, it, consistent watering is king in your garden. Don't over fertilize, stay away from manures. Get a timer. All of this garden is on timers. Okay. That's my story. <laughs> Great, Catherine. Do these, do, do these things correctly and you'll have a successful victory garden, right? That's right. Right. <laughs> I, I want everyone to set, I want to set everyone up for success so that they can come back and say, yeah, I got 10 pounds of potatoes for every one pound I planted. And I got 10 pounds of peppers off my pepper plant. And I got 15 pounds of tomatoes. Yeah. It, I want everyone set up for success. Great. Well, we appreciate it, Catherine. The, we have a question, and I, I know we've talked about it a little bit. I think it'd be really good to specifically address the question, but maybe elaborate if need be. And so the question comes in from Ann, uh, excuse me, Anna. The wind was very hard on my plants last year. Any advice for protecting my plants from it? If you can find a different... If you can find a location where you've got a building to protect it, and again, east sun is best. So if you can grow your vegetable garden on the east side of a building, an afternoon shade is fine. You know, the, the, the myth is you need to have eight, 10, 12 hours of sun. No, you don't. If you can get six hours of sunlight, you're, you're still golden. But having that morning sun is best. And if you can use a building to block the wind, even better, and it because then you get afternoon shade. That's perfect. Otherwise, um, you're gonna have to build a wind fence of some sort. Um, snow, put you know the orange construction fence up or straw bales if you can find them. I've seen people use pallets. Mm -hmm. Pallets, Pallet. yeah, it, yeah. And you well, really don't need a lot of space to be a successful gardener. You can grow produce any almost anywhere. Um, you don't have to have a big garden that you have deline uh, delineated out uh, from your the rest of your yard. I also right. knew some um, old time gardeners that around the Laramie area who are growing green beans and they put they're kind of like uh, not shingles but like board fences that have been cut up and they put a little piece of board on the uh, upwind side from each plant. And so it's a little labor intensive, but it keeps them from getting so beat up when they're seedlings. And so that they have more time to grow out of our windy season and into mm -hmm. the summer when the wind slows down. Yep. I've seen people use shake, sink, sh shake shingles. Boy, if I could speak, yes. it'd be a whole that's lot what better. I was thinking of. <laughs> I think what it was called. Thank you, Jeff. 
Yeah. Well, and I, I think the other aspect of wind protection is, is you need to put it in the direction of the prevailing winds, right? And of that time of year, correct? So, so, you know, at least up in my area, you know, we get a lot of west, northwest winds, north winds, predominantly in the wintertime. They're cold, hard blasts. But that doesn't mean during the growing season, that's where my, my consistent winds come from. And so you want that wind break on the consistent wind side during the growing season. Right. And where I'm at, the summer winds shift and they come out of the southeast to the southwest. That's kind of the this summer pattern. Spring and fall patterns are a little different. So you just kind of, you have to pay attention. You know, when you're a gardener, you, you need to pay attention to seasonal changes, monthly changes within your gardening world. And so you really have to have a, a stronger connect to that. So our, our last question that I have for you, Catherine, is uh, uh, off of Facebook, Barb asked, when do I plant my potatoes? When is the timing of that? Is it Good Friday? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I will plant, so keep in mind, I'm down in, in Laramie County. I'm east of Cheyenne. So my gardening season is a little different. So you know your growing season. I will plant my potatoes right along April, the end of April, first part of May, right in there. You know, this picture is from early June. So I planted those last year um, in April, late April. Great. Catherine, can you stop sharing your screen? We'll, we'll wrap up here. I should have probably had you do that when we were doing handling our questions, but this has been a great presentation. And, and so just in summary, to, to wrap this up, last few thoughts, but the top 10 mistakes covered that we covered so far, I just wanted to go through them as we closed up. So not watering enough, right? Make sure yep. you're getting plenty of water, check that soil profile, make sure your irrigation is working appropriately, getting them enough water. Choosing the right plants that need to, uh, for the long growing season, get the appropriate growing season varieties, right? Shorter right. is usually better um, in our area. Know your soil, know what you have, right? Uh, don't make guesses, don't make speculations. If you don't know, get it tested, right? right? And that's also why we're here. We'll help you interpret that analysis and help you, what can I do to improve that soil? Having poor seed storage conditions, right? right? Store that seed properly, or if you don't have the ability to store seeds, get good seed to start with. Right. Not rotating your garden plants. So every year that the tomatoes should not be planted in this part of the garden. Rotate, right. the, rotate the families rotate. of the vegetables through your garden. Yep. Not locating the garden in the right spot, right? Not enough sun, not convenient, the wrong size. All, no wind protection, right? Just what we talked about. Right. Not planning for the wind. <laughs> we get a lot of wind in Wyoming, especially if you live in Casper. It's very consistent. And so having some means of wind protection, I guess a, a point of clarification for me would be it doesn't have to totally stop the wind, right? It just needs right. to break the wind. Right. And so it's not a strong gale force onto your plants, but right. a little bit of, of air movement and breeze through the garden is a good thing. Yes, it is. Uh, not planning ahead for weed control and not getting ahead of the weeds or allowing the weeds to get ahead of you is maybe a better way to say that. And then the last one I captured was not planning for a frost event. So getting back to that Afton, uh, or excuse me, yeah, Afton and Star Valley area, uh, you know, that season extension, right? Protecting those edges. Right, that's, that's a whole, that's a whole nother lecture, actually. Yeah, so, <laughs> so the picture behind me, this is my garden. That's winter squash, all on black plastic. I got sweet corn, tomatoes, I grow peanuts, I grow all sorts of stuff. And so it's, it's totally doable. You don't need to have season extension, you just have to use the materials to your best advantage. And from Crystal, let's do a Star Valley lecture. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. I would, that would be, that would be fun. And um, yeah, don't use manures in your vegetable garden. Stay away from that myth. Uh, don't use Epsom salts. And if, you're, if your vegetable garden, if you have good soil, 
and you haven't over amended it and you've got good water, you don't worry about the insects. Don't worry about bad bugs. It's, it's when you over fertilize and you've over amended that soil that you end up with insect problems. And the last thing you want to have to ever do in your vegetable garden is go in there with, with an insecticide and start, start having to spray things because now you're taking out your good bugs, your lace wings, your ladybugs, your butterflies, your bees, your native bees. And, and so I'm, I'm kind of stepping on Jeff's territory here, but um, <laughs> totally healthy soil, yeah, healthy soil it is, you're not going to have insect problems. Not in Wyoming. <laughs> they get blown away, right? <laughs> well, and I, I guess from my perspective, when I talk to a lot of, of a lot of clientele on their gardens or what they should be doing or that is the, the first step and the best thing I can advise people is go out and try something. Go out and have fun and enjoy it. Try and grow something and improve because gardening is it's a, as much of an art as it is a science. And we can give you all the information and knowledge that we can, but you have to put it into practicality in your, in your area, in your garden space, whatever that is, but go out and enjoy Go out and do it and have fun and you're going to fail. You're going to succeed. It's all going to be great. And gardening is a life's passion. It's a journey, right? It's not the sprint. It is a long distance race of yep. learning and growing and doing better and experiencing. And yep. so just don't be afraid to try. Yeah, I, I started vegetable gardening when I was 12. And, and so I've been doing this home almost all, my whole life. So I have lots of experience with it. And, and then I have a horticulture degree to back it up. And don't expect miracles out of your first year garden. It, the first year garden is going to be tough. And, and just be happy with anything you get out of it. And then knowing that the second year will be better because now you've learned and now your soil is starting to improve. So don't, don't give up. If you had a bad year, the first year is like you're, you're listening to me and going, I, I got two potatoes and I didn't get anything off my tomato plants. Don't give up because the next year will be better. Right. No more. Yeah. right. Well, and with that, that's all I have. Do you have any other questions, Jeff, in front of you or Jenny? I don't see anything else. We had a few comments come in. Yep. We're all good. Hey, we had a few comments just saying, thank you, Catherine. So great. Very knowledgeable. Um, you know, let's do that Star Valley lecture. Uh, what good time. Uh, but with that, thank you so much for everybody to join us. We, we really appreciate it. We do this for you guys and trying to reach out and pr provide some information to you on various topics. We really appreciate taking the time and joining us. Catherine, so, thank you so much for your time and energy and knowledge on this subject. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Okay, thanks. It's always fun. So the last thing we'll wrap up is, uh, as you know, if you've joined us before, uh, we record these shows. We're going to post them back up on Barnyards and Backyards Live uh, on the website. So please get on there. Look that up. If you want to view this again, you can. Uh, also on there is the schedule for future shows. So keep checking on there to see what shows are coming up uh, and checking in there. Also, if there were any resources mentioned, we try and get those resources back up on that website with the recording. So it's a one-stop shop for you. We had a lot of discussion going on in the chat box that we weren't able to bring forward in the show and a lot of questions of, of how do I start seeds or how do I manage grasshoppers? Well, this Barnyards and Backyards website is a treasure trove. And that's what I think Jenny calls it is a treasure trove of information on various subjects. And there's one specifically on just gardens. And so get in there. Those resources are there and available for you. These videos are on there for you. We have some other videos from the called from the ground up that are there to try and help you and, and share that information. The other part is, Catherine said, if, if you don't understand your soils, you need help with a soil test, you want information on a specific garden, or you want to connect with uh, Catherine or Jeff or any of the, the hosts on the show or any of our guests, please contact your local extension office, right? We have a local extension office in every county and one on the Wind River Indian Reservation. That's what we're here for is to help support you and try and connect you with good, valuable resources and good information. The last part is, is we do this show for you. And so we want to hear feedback from you. And so uh, Jenny, if she hasn't done it already, she throws a link in the chat box or the comments uh, box 
for you to provide evaluation back to us. And so that evaluation is a really short few questions, feedback to us to the show. We try and we, we pay attention to that. We look at that, even if it's about rockets, we do the best we can to answer to those questions. And so we want feedback from you. If you take some time, feed that, we'll do that and try and improve our show. With that, thank you so much. Have a good rest of your Friday and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Catherine.